Paul, good morning. Yeah, my, my pleasure to be here. What do you make of the sale of a caddy? Yeah, so this has been in the works for probably, you know, six months plus now, and I think it's just now uh, finally formalized. Um, but uh, this, this mine has been through a, a lot of owners uh, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. I think uh, Burgundy could be a good fit. Um, they, they seem like they're, you know, quite, you know, enthusiastic about the future of the natural diamond industry. I think they see good value here. I think they, you know, they, they realize, you know, the, the resilience of this industry. Um, and I think even, you know, given the fact that, you know, there has been some disappointment um, and, and investment in, in diamond mining companies globally, they, they seem like they're, you know, kind of committed for, for, the, for the long run here. So I think they could be a good fit. Um, it's an Australian-based uh, company. And, uh, and, and I think the timing, you know, could be right for them. And it seems like, uh, you know, th- th- their ambitions are properly placed. What more can you tell us about Burgundy Diamond Mines and, and where they operate? Yeah, so it's a, a relatively new company. And I think the strategy was to kind of take advantage of some of these diamond assets globally that, uh, you know, may- maybe are, you know, considered heavily discounted in the market. They, um, you know, were involved with an exploration property in Nunavut. And, uh they, they were looking to redevelop uh, the Allendale mine, which is is based in Australia. So it's kind of a you know a, a newer company. They um, you know have also looked into uh, the, the cutting and polishing business and you know the the, the downstream the retail business. So I, the, I think initially the aim of the company was to kind of be a vertically integrated uh, diamond company, focusing more on on, on like higher end fancy color diamonds. But I think with this deal, it seems like they're, they're, they're refocusing the company more on the upstream, you know, segment. Um, I think think if you just look at the capital deployed, you know, this uh, acquisition um, is is quite large relative to, um, you know, the other deals that they've done in in, in the recent past. Burgundy is the third owner a caddy has had in in the last few years. Why do you think it's changed hands so many times? You know, I think as, you know, these, I mean, so a caddy is a world-class mine. It's, It's probably one of the most, uh, profitable diamond mines in, in history. It was the first, you know, diamond mine in Canada. But as you know, these mines get older, they get, you know, it, it, the economics uh, get more difficult. I mean, the mine gets deeper, it gets, you know, more expensive to operate. Sometimes the greater the quality of the diamonds could change. Um, so I think it's mines in general get difficult to operate the older they get. But it's, you know, it, it, it's still a, a diamond mine. It's, you know, what at least at one point was was a, a world class diamond mine and. Um, you know, there's, there's an intrinsic value there. And I think, um, you know, investors are always, you know, looking for opportunities, um, you know, and, and things that maybe they could do a little bit differently to make the, you know, the, the mine operations a little bit better and make the profits a little bit better. So I think maybe that's, that's kind of why we've seen this mine, uh, you know, change, change hands uh, as much as it has recently. But, uh, you know, it's the, 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 the diamond mines in Canada are kind of getting, you know, few and far between. So, you know, Divic is looks like that's going to be, um, you know, probably permanently closed by the end of this decade. And, and Gaucho Quay, you know, is probably going to be in production through, um, you know, through next decade. Um, Renard in Quebec is, is still in production, but they're, they're kind of few and far between. And I think what's interesting about the Canadian mines is uh, most diamond purchases are from uh, American or North American consumers. So, you know, half of, of global diamond jewelry is bought by, by U.S. consumers. And I think there's something special about, you know, an American consumer buying a Canadian diamond versus a diamond kind of the other side of the world. So I, I always kind of think there is this opportunity, you know, for, you know, Canadian diamonds to do particularly well, given that there's such a, a large percentage of, of global diamond demand comes from, you know, North American consumers. And it just seems like such an obvious fit there. So I think there always is this desire for, you know, Canadian diamond mines, given how given how, how few and far between they are and given um, how much of, of the you know consumer demand comes from, you know, North America. Paul, it's been uh, it's been previously reported that a caddy's mine life was going to end somewhere, you know, around 2028. Uh, Burgundy says it, it wants to extend that. Can you give us a sense of how it could go about doing that? Yeah, so you know, it, it, it kind of does seem to to, to to keep changing. I think that's you know relatively typical for you know kind of a, a mine at this stage of its life. There's going to be um, you, say, you say new discoveries of, of maybe new ore bodies or you know more technical studies that kind of determine an area that's you know maybe now economic that wasn't in the past. 
you know, then you always have, you know, diamond prices changing and costs changing. So there's all these moving parts that are, you know, constantly leading to, you know, the, the development of different strategies. I think as it stands now, it looks like they are uh, going to be developing and, and producing a, you know, the, the Point Lake deposit. And I think that's going to take production kind of through the end of this decade. You know, I think 2028 right now is kind of the, the figure. And then beyond that, you know, they're looking at deploying new technology to actually remote remotely uh, mine, um, you know, some of the, the open pits that have, have been exhausted using the traditional conventional method. So um, that would be something that's new for the industry. And, and it seems like that, that that could be a viable strategy. So I think they're kind of in the testing phase of that. And I think they're hoping to, you know, be able to make a decision, you know, if, if that's a, you know, a strategy that will work, uh, you know, and if it did, it would take, you know, mining into next decade. Can you expand on that, on, on what sort of, when you say the like non-conventional mining, can you give us a, a more of a sense of what that looks like? Yes, I think it would be actually, you know, r- robotic equipment. So they would actually let the mine flood um, and then it would be, you know, remotely operated vehicles would actually, you know, do the mining. Um, and it would probably be, you know, the, the, the ore would probably be turned into somewhat of a slurry and then they would, you know, kind of, kind of bring it uh, to surface and then process it from there. But it would be different from, you know, just, you know, using explosives to break the hard rock and then loading that rock into a truck and then driving the truck out of the pit. So it would be, you know, a technology that we really haven't seen, you know, in the diamond industry. There is um, offshore remote mining um, off the coast of, of Western Africa. But as far as, you know, a traditional uh, open pit kimberlite mine like Akadi is, um, there, there, there's really no strategy where, you know, a, a flooded mine like that is, is being remotely uh, mined. So this would be uh, something that, that's new for the industry. Do you think Burgundy has the resources to take that on? You know, I, I think they do. I think if you just look at, um, you know, the, the, the chairman, the financial backer, he, he certainly seems, you know, to, 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 to be fit to take something on like that. And, and again, I think, you know, when, when you look at what Burgundy's doing here, I think uh, it, it's quite clear that they have a longer term strategy. I don't think they would go through an acquisition like this just for, you know, a, a couple more years of mining. So it does seem like, like this is a strategy they're taking seriously and they believe that they can be successful with it. Hmm. Paul, broadly speaking, what do you think the impact of this sale will be on, you know, our territorial economy that relies on these mines so heavily for resource royalties and employment? What do you think the impact will be? I think at the end of the day, what it does is I think it provides an option uh, to keep, you know, say the Akati mine running longer than maybe it otherwise would be. So, you know, just extending that, that mine life. And I, I think if it did, uh, you know, convert to a remote mining operation, obviously there would probably be less people employed and it would, it would, it would change, you know, the, the structure of the operation in that way. But, but again, I, I think it, it could certainly extend, um, you know, the mine life, you know, significantly. And they also, you know, seem to be, you know, keen on continuing exploration. And, and who knows, maybe there'll be, you know, a, a new economic deposit discovered, you know, in the interim that, uh, could also allow for further conventional mining. So we'll see. All right, Paul, we really appreciate you chatting with us this morning. Yeah, my pleasure. Anytime. Thanks.